Funding for New Mexico in Focus provided by the McCune Charitable Foundation. And the Dnieper Natural History Programming Fund for KNME-TV. And viewers like you. This week on New Mexico in Focus, as chaos erupts in Washington, New Mexico's only D.C. Republican objects to the vote count. Plus, for so long we've just sort of hoped that it would fix itself and that working with the market, it would somehow magically work. That does not work. With a change of power, what's ahead for the predicted flood of evictions? New Mexico in Focus starts now. Thanks for joining us this week. I'm your host, Gene Grant. There are a lot of heavy hearts this week as pro-Trump rioters took over the U.S. Capitol, attempting to stop Congress from certifying electoral college votes that make Joe Biden the next president of the United States. That, as newly, newly elected Republican Congresswoman Yvette Harrell from CD2 objects to the vote, the line we'll discuss. We'll also look at Christmas services at two Albuquerque megachurches that flouted public health orders and a new anti-discrimination law in the Duke City. Our land returns with a look at a proposed law that would expand Bandelier National Monument, but at what cost to sovereign native tribes. We begin with the line. Yvette Harrell claimed a rigged election when she lost two years ago. After winning the second congressional district in November, she's complaining of other electoral problems. Now, as violent pro-Trump pro demonstrators descended on the Capitol Wednesday, she planned to object to electors from six states, along with more than 100 other Republican colleagues. Given the stunning violence, some expected her to change course in her objections to votes in Arizona and Pennsylvania. She did not. Here to offer thoughts, our line opinion panel, president of a collective action, action strategies, Giovanna Rossi is with us. Thank you. Good to see you. And from Ciarza Social Digital, founder Crystal Ciarza joins us as well. Very glad you have you here. It's great to have Justine Fox Young back with us. She's a former state representative and a local attorney. Welcome to you all. All right, here's what Representative Harrell wrote about her decision. Quote, my hope is that elevating this debate to the highest and final level the Constitution provides for will result in a continued discussion of our electoral process. Action must be taken to restore Americans' faith in our fairness of our elections and the legitimacy of our institutions, end quote. Justine, did she accomplish her goal? Well, to the extent that there is a real issue there, and I mm -hmm. think there, there are a lot of people across the country who think that there are issues with voter integrity, with, you know, the number of votes that are cast before election day, you know, really b banal technical issues like signature verification and extending absentee ballot deadlines. Um, All those things that have been around for a decade, is that what you're saying? <laughs> Yeah, and you know, I raised a lot of these issues when I was in the legislature. These are ongoing um, legislative fights. I think it's there's a process, and it's and it's appropriate for our members of Congress to the extent that they think it's important to raise these issues. I don't really take issue with with that. I don't really know what her goal is, though. I mean, mm -hmm. I, and I think you know we've seen in some of the comments in, in the last 24 hours from people like Tom Cotton and others yeah there's a meaty issue there there's work for state legislatures to do you know to the extent that there's doubt about election results but a lot of this is just political theater it's fundraising it's capitalizing on a moment so i don't want to really speculate about what yvette harrell wants to make out of this moment um but it but if it is substantive changes in say new mexico law or pennsylvania law or Georgia law, um, she's not in a position to affect those changes. I mm -hmm. mean, you can, and, and this has happened, there's precedent for this in many prior elections where Congress debates these issues, raises the issues at the point of, you know, where we were yesterday as we um, certify the election. And that's, that's not improper, but raising it to a fever pitch, um, you know, I don't know if she wants to raise money out of it, if she wants to inherit the 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 pierce legacy on this i i don't know um yeah. but i i don't see her activating or motivating the legislatures who who need to do the work that i that i think she's asking be done that thank you your last point there was was kind of what I've, it's been in my head as well giovanna let me read you uh, partly her quote that was in the journal 
Um, as a state representative of New Mexico, Pennsylvania's unconstitutional actions disenfranchised my constituents and the constituents of my colleagues. How? I, 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 I don't get the connection there. Yeah, when I heard that on the clip, when she said that, it was really uh, confusing. Uh, and so I think she, you know, somebody, some staffer put that into her comments because they thought, oh, we need to make a connection to New Mexico because people are going to be mad about her doing this. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, but you didn't accomplish <laughs> what you needed to do there. Um, it doesn't make any sense. And um, th the bottom line is that by participating in that effort in the political theater, as, as Justine said, um, she was part of enabling what happened yesterday she was part of the problem and i don't think any amount of explaining away now uh can help her in this situation i think mm -hmm. we need to call it like it is and and um you know and say like that that was enabling the 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 events that happened yesterday it was um unacceptable as, as a member of congress mm -hmm. to do that mm -hmm. Crystal, I probably should let the viewers know as we air this Friday night, we're taping this on Thursday midday, a whole lot of things could have happened <laughs> between then and now, so I apologize to the viewers in case something has happened. But on that note, Ms. Harold did say that what happened on Capitol Hill was reprehensible. That was a quote on Twitter, and she's also aligned herself, however, with Cowboys for Trump, Coy Griffin, who was pictured at the event, he was at the U.S. Capitol, Yesterday, when all this was going on, not inside, the picture of him was outside. She has walked this amazingly thin line for a lot of months when it comes to this stuff, and this guy, Coy Griffin especially. She always seems to be having to answer for him and his, her association with him. I, 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 you know, is this do something about her credibility to, when we hear her say these things in your view? It's a great question in terms of credibility because instantly when I read, I heard the speech, I said, wow, whoever wrote that for the entire Republican um, group of legislators that were on the opposition must be proud about the fact how well she read somebody else's statement. Right. That's immediately the first thought that I, I had. And, and I also think that with Yvette Harrell and obviously, you know, dancing with Cowboys for Trump, um, who I have unfortunately met through Twitter, just like many of us have. Um, it, it's really interesting that when she, for, for some of her first words were, it's unfortunate that this is going to be, uh, this topic is going to be my first speech as an elected official right. into the house. And what made me say, what would made, when I heard that, I said to myself, well, it will be the first and only speech that will dictate your loyalty to the party and which side of the Republican party you have chosen. And I say this because other Republican um, legislators like uh, Senator Lindsey Graham said something that made me just uh, say, I, I never thought I would say the day or never would imagine that I would see the day. And he said, the mob got me to do something I'd never do, which is admit that Senator Rand Paul is right. <laughs> He could have said those exact same words. She could have said something along those same party lines. So that speech for her, as canned and as read as it sounds, even if she um, if she voted to upheld the electoral college vote, she would still have a strong legislative voting support in um, in the county in the counties that she represents. Mm -hmm that the fact that she chose this portion of the aisle may actually affect her reelection in two years, 100%. She could have disagreed and she would have been fine. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. I think she figure out her legacy um, on day one. That's an interesting point there. Um, I've ha I have to follow up Justine with on that very point. It's interesting. Political future from this, I, you know, I have to imagine that she might have gone into this thinking, well, I'm an ex-legislator in New Mexico. I could walk back there and swing a big hammer about reform if I join this and it's things sort of work out our way, but it didn't work out their way. And so it just seems to me, how could she, again, credibly come back to New Mexico and say, we need to do some reform things it, it, through this process? Does that work? Well, let me answer a slightly different question and okay. what I've been thinking about. And I, and I wish that there were more conversation around the Electoral College about 
what happens to everybody who's not in one of these six states that that mattered this election? And I think what what um, Yvette Harrell is feeling is not misplaced. She didn't articulate it very well, but when she says our fates depend on Pennsylvania and Michigan, and you know, this is what has happened in this country. And as we've become more polarized, and as as, as the number of swing states has diminished. We places like New Mexico find themselves without a voice, right. and it's very hard as a representative from a state like what is now a flyover state, um, as far as presidential politics is concerned, to have a voice. And so you end up jumping on the bandwagon and you know waving the flag because you can't you know you can't deliver in other ways, and that is a problem for our country. I think that is a should be a bigger conversation piece than. Um, than some of the other electoral reforms that are that are being discussed, but that, I think that's what she's trying to say. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, we're at the mercy of these swing states. Does well, fair, fair enough. I think Crystal's point, though, if she, maybe if she had written it herself and come from her own heart, maybe we, that might have come across a little bit more. It just it just rang a little flat. Well, you know? all these stump speeches do. I mean, yeah. you stay and watch C-SPAN any night, and you're going to feel that way. They say very yeah. little anymore. That's a good point. So then let's call it like it is. So, so then let's say what this really was, which was it was a political stunt, and it was unacceptable. And I think we're going to see you know people really working against her in, in her next election. Mm. Yeah, I think that probably is true. Interesting points there. Hey, we're out of time on this topic, but don't go anywhere. We're talking evictions next. These days, as you can see, since the first point of contact about five, 600 years ago, and where the American Indian is now today, and what do you picture it to be in another 500 years? Is there going to be these sites that are available for our children to help maintain their way of life and to keep their way of life? The COVID pandemic persists in its viral attack and continues to throw light on how important housing is to people's health. There's been a small extension of the national moratorium on evictions and our state's moratorium will remain in effect as long as the New Mexico Supreme Court says so. But unless the housing crisis is dealt with head on, many believe moratoriums just kick the can down the road, as they say. To look at the issue of evictions and housing rights, here's NMIF's Megan Kamrick with UNM law professor, housing advocate, and line panelist, Serge Martinez. Thank you for joining us here on New Mexico in Focus, Serge. The national eviction moratorium set to end the last day of 2020 was extended for one month. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Lawmakers struck the coronavirus aid deal on December 20th to extend the national eviction moratorium through the end of January and establish an assistance rental fund of $25 billion. How does that new deal translate for New Mexicans? Uh, so the, the moratorium, the CDC imposed moratorium that's extended is, you know, in New Mexico, it may not have that much of an impact because we still have the stay that was issued by our state Supreme Court back in March that is still in place and is still keeping people from being evicted for non-payment of rent. Uh, we don't know how long that will last, and there are certainly um, things that could be done to make it a little bit more robust. But uh, in terms of how that extension of the federal moratorium will affect folks, it's probably you know, not going to make a huge difference in terms of how that affects individual renters who are facing eviction. Um, the $25 billion, right? We our share of that in New Mexico looks to be about $200 million, and it's not clear yet exactly how that will be distributed, how much of that is purely for rent and how much might go to other things like utilities. But that's a big pot of money that will be coming, you know, toward to New Mexico. So we can look to that as, I think, providing some relief to tenants and landlords who have really been struggling, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in this pandemic. The, you know, the, the rules around the allocation of that money leave gaps and folks who will be uncovered and doesn't address all of the the potential, the folks who might be potentially in need of that, but right. it's a good start. So according to data from the Census Household Pulse Survey just over a month ago, one in five adult renters said they were behind on their rent. Do you find similar statistics here in New Mexico? 
Yeah, I mean, no one knows exactly what the numbers are, right? But anecdotally, and certainly based on what I'm hearing from around the state and seeing what's going on, that sounds certainly not too low, uh, or not too high, rather, right? It may be too low, given, you know, the economic issues that we already have here in New Mexico and the housing instability that was already here before March when it was all exacerbated. But yeah, those numbers, I mean, whatever the actual numbers are, they are shockingly high. It is very high. And evictions worsen the spread of COVID. There's just a big study on that. $25 billion only covers about a quarter of the back rent that's owed, even though it's a huge amount of money. Um, New administration coming in, will we get better numbers? Is it too late to stem the spread of of COVID from evictions? Uh, I don't think it's too late. I think we're getting to a point, you know, we've been talking for months about the the tidal wave of evictions that's going to be coming. And there have been stopgap measures and ways that the can has been kicked down the road. Um, We're getting to a point now where the amount of back rent that is being, that has been, you know, stayed or delayed is going to become unpayable. So Mm -hmm. even, even when folks get back to work or whatnot, they're not going to be in a position to be able to pay, as you said, you know, these hundred billions of dollars of back rent. It would require a real commitment to, to facing this, I don't. But because of the the half measures that have been in place have worked well enough, right? We don't see the the huge mass dislocation that we've been worried. That day is coming. We just don't know exactly when that will be. But what is needed is immediate, intensive intervention right now to stop that. Because you're right. When people are dislocated, it's not just their belongings that that that, that move around with them, right? It's mm-hmm. um, the coronavirus thrives in that environment. Early in 2020, you and a couple of others formed a group called Amparo, which means Protection Refuge Shelter, and it was created to rapidly distribute rental assistance to families in Albuquerque who have kids. It's a pretty narrow focus, as you say, Mm -hmm. a new organization just starting out, and you created Amparo because you were coming across families facing eviction when resources were, uh, were available because getting those resources was often really cumbersome and slow moving. Um, and in an email to our producers here at InFocus, you said, I'm going to quote you, I have mixed feelings about Amparo. I absolutely think it fills a need, and I'm so pleased with all the love and support we've gotten from folks, but I'm angry that it exists at all, because that means the state is not treating housing as a priority, let alone a human right. So what must the state do to make housing a priority? Right. I mean, I think the first step is to recognize really how important housing is to all the things we want to accomplish as a state and housing stability. We've seen over the last 10 months what it means for public health, but we haven't really also understood what it means for individual health, mental health, for community stability. But we treat it as this sort of commodity and hope that the market will address it rather than something that is a right and a bedrock foundation. So, you know, here in New Mexico, we don't even have anybody whose job it is at the state level to coordinate and discuss all of the housing issues Mm -hmm. that we have as a state. We have different folks who have different parts of the job, but, you know, I've been for quite some time suggesting that, advocating for us to have somebody whose job it is, a department or a, a, you know, a, a person in a particular position whose job it is to understand and coordinate all of these little strands of housing to really at, at, you know, understand the, the centrality of stable housing in everything we do in New Mexico and to put the resources toward it, right? Rather than rely as we're doing, right? On small nonprofits, on individual donations, on, on disjointed uh, and dispersed sort of sources of, of assistance rather than looking at, at treating it as a state, you know, as some as a priority of our state and create a sort of a single focus on it. And as I said, it's easy to talk about it, but it's important to put resources toward that. Well, it reminds me of the early childhood issues because those are sort of scattered across departments. Yeah. And now we have a secretary focused on early childhood. Yeah, right? I, I think there's a lot of, position, you know. Yeah, I, th- I think it's a good analogy, right? Because there are, you know, there's, folks who are trying to create affordable housing and and develop more housing. There are folks who are worried about health, public health, folks who are worried about community and economic development. But there's there's no one single person whose job it is or place 
whose job it is to bring that all together and sort of, you know, coordinate all the efforts and all the things that we're doing. But, and again, but it's also symbolic, right? The, the lack of that shows what we do and don't care about in New Mexico in terms of what we think the role of our state is uh, in helping the folks who live here. What should the, we be doing at a national level to make housing a priority? Well, I mean, first of all, recognizing that it is a real issue and it's something that Congress has been doing. They've been, um, you know, pushing and, and getting some, some money out the door and putting, you know, measures in place. But I think all of the halting, the, the stays and the moratoriums, they're really, they're, they're a half measure. They're not addressing the full extent of the issue. They are saying, well, we can, you know, let's just try to hold this back until something happens down the road and missing the, the, the idea that we're gonna need people, tenants and landlords have been missing money, right? They've been going without. So we really, I think it needs a real commitment in the moment to addressing that. Going forward, right, we have no longer have a tradition of public housing in this country and in fact have limited our ability to expand it to, in, some, in some ways. And what that again says is, you know, this is something the market will take care of that. We're not going to worry about it rather than this is a real issue that is central, not just to the state of New Mexico, to every person in the United States and should be treated as a right that we have and something that because we can provide housing, we will and we'll reap the benefits from that. But for so long, we've just sort of hoped that it would fix itself and that working with the market, it would somehow magically work. That does not work. It has not worked. That was the problem before the pandemic. It's only been highlighted more so. When the vaccine has been given to every person in America, we will still have this issue. And the time to focus on it is now rather than wait for another crisis or calamity down the road. Yeah, we have Section 8, but the people I talk to anecdotally when I help them with rent is that's a long waiting list. New Mexico yeah. also has a significant population of Native Americans and many Though they have housing, they're living in substandard or overcrowded conditions often. Many others lack housing altogether on tribal lands. Many indigenous people are homeless in urban areas. And COVID has hit tribal areas and Native Americans particularly hard, with poor housing playing a big part. Many Native American elders don't believe the federal government cares enough to address the problem. Is there a community approach that's the answer? Well, I mean, I think, you know, we have seen the, as you're saying, like sort of the, the lack of attention to community economic development in tribal communities around, around the country, here in New Mexico in particular, uh, and, you know, and the Navajo Nation, which spans a few, uh, several states, seeing the lack of support, investment, concern about economic development uh, in those communities and really pushing for prosperity in, in tribal communities is, we see how that plays out. Right. Yeah, the housing conditions in parts of the tribal communities in New Mexico are just deplorable and below what most folks would think are acceptable in, you know, in this time and in this place. And yet we let it go. So uh, an understanding that we need to do more in that realm is super important. But I think investing in prosperity and pushing for prosperity in those communities is is key and crucial. We only have about a minute, Serge, but are you looking at any proposed bills in the upcoming legislative session that will address housing? Yeah, there, there are a few things up there um, that I think will be interesting. There's some, there's an effort, and I will, in full disclosure, I've been part of, to, to change some of the, the, the timings in uh, evictions to give tenants more time, ideally to work things out with their landlord to, to get the resources that they need so it doesn't move quite so quickly. Um, and, you know, to just create more incentive for folks to sit down and work it out rather than go straight to eviction. Um, there are a couple, uh, couple other things up there, Andrea Romero and Angelica Rubio, representatives from Santa Fe and Las Cruces, have been putting forward a, uh, a bill that has a few tweaks and important changes to, to landlord-tenant law uh, mm. and, and procedure. Well, I appreciate you coming back and talking with us about this. Uh, obviously, it's going to be an ongoing issue. So I'm sure we'll see yeah. you again in the future. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks so much. Thank you. Silent night, crowded night.
A, vi a video posted by the Legacy Mega Church showed a Christmas service packed with worshipers, maskless and singing. A similar video surfaced at an event at Calvary Church in Albuquerque. Now, the governor's office fined both Legacy and Calvary for not enforcing mask mandates and for violating capacity limits, $10,000 each. Both churches have conservative active, activist pastors. Steve Smotherman and Skip Heitzig, Heitzig, as you know, were making a statement. Crystal, do you think they got something across here, or is this something that I missed and the rest of us missed here? You know, it was, uh, and I'm, I'm actually trying to pull up the statements that they both made. Mm -hmm. um, that's a really difficult situation for um, for the public for for commentary because, you know, the the churchgoers themselves knew the risk that risks that they were taking by participating in Christmas mass, mm -hmm. and then obviously the administration. But what I found very um, not necessarily the best public relations move, in my honest opinion, was that not only did they respond to say, when one church had said, we're gonna fight the $10,000 fine, mm -hmm. the other one said, we deeply apologized, you know, we did caution everybody and, and we were trying to be as conscious as possible considering the square, the square, uh, capacity, the square foot capacity of the church. But then they came out and talked about the great charitable things that they did um, over the last oh, over the last several months during the pandemic to show that they were trying to support the community right. and the money that they raised but it was like where what happened to humility guys <laughs> like come on and it just became really really difficult to 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 say like who was in the wrong and who was in the right obviously the easy answer is um you know stay at home wear a mask uh, don't participate in things like this and it is absolute good leadership to make sure that you protect people that you serve um, as you notice, the, uh, the Archbish Archdiocese of Santa Fe has been tremendously suffering because of all the Catholic churches that have been closed by all this. Right. But um, none of them have, have been spotlighted the way that Legacy and Calvary did. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not hard um, to say no. It's, but it is not difficult to find ways to pray together if that's how you choose. So, mm -hmm. Giovanna, let me read you a quote from Skip Heitzig um, from Legacy Church. He provided this to Ch uh, KRQE News 13 about that Christmas Day service. Quote, we have taken the pandemic seriously from the start and have prudent measures in place. But when governments exceed their constitutional authority and contradict what we are called on by God to do, we answer first to his authority. Interesting point there. There's like three things mixed up in there, but I want you to get your overall, your overall take on that quote. Is that settle the issue for you does <laughs> uh well yeah when i read that i it just and that's what i was going to bring up here was just the blatant you know oh. the, the statement there that mm -hmm. actually the law like that they're above the law i mean that that's basically what he's saying he's saying a lot in that statement but what i took away was wow okay, here's a leader who many, many people follow. And uh, he is, you know, basically saying we're above the law. We don't agree with the public health order. Therefore, we're not going to follow it. And then in the same breath, you know, he's saying like, we're, we're doing everything we can in the pandemic. It's just a big contradiction. And, and uh, you know, when you talk about leadership and telling the truth, and doing the right thing. None of those boxes are checked here. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it's very unfortunate. And uh, the, the fines, you know, he, they're seeing these fines, which are really small, I think, compared to probably what they could be. But, and, and I don't know what, you know, I'm not sure what the fines really do in terms of a, a response, but yeah, it, it was it was an insufficient um, explanation for what happened. Mm -hmm. I mean, apologize to Mr. Heitzig real quick. He's he's of course associated with Calvary and not Legacy. I apologize to him and the church there. Go go ahead, Crystal. My fault. Right, and I'm just going to comment really quickly. If he feels that we have to follow the, the law of the Lord in this particular situation, why did Pope Francis choose not to have any type of services for both Easter and and Church Sunday? The Catholic Church is is um, the Catholic Church would easily rebuke that specific argument. Mm -hmm. 
you know what, now the thought on this, you know, church members interact with the truly vulnerable. I mean, we talk about this all the time. That was one of the reasons why the governor cut down the percentages, of course. And doesn't this behavior put those vulnerable people, Justine, at risk? Yeah, I think it does. And I, I mean, I think to put it in context, our state government has acted pretty gingerly with respect to the churches and mm -hmm. been pretty careful um, as as litigation has proceeded. And I'll say, you know, Skip Heitzig may appeal to natural law now. This is like classic forum shopping. They went to federal court and they were shut down. And mm -hmm. the reason that they were shut down is, I think, you know, there's a there's a principle in law and economics called the, the least cost avoider. This is a classic case where there's a really inexpensive and easy and cheap precaution that that these parishioners and these churches can take um, to increase safety. Mm -hmm. And that's all I have to do, whether you agree or not. It's it's science agrees <laughs> that um, that that it will do that. And so if you want to predict how these these cases are going to come out in court when when they can take that easy precaution they should and and if they don't they're going to lose and so now to appeal to natural law um you know i guess you hope you get a different answer but um but yes you know the, the, we're talking about very vulnerable populations and we're talking about um a collective action problem that is so serious because you know i think crystal started out talking about making the assessing the the danger and the risk to to oneself of course the problem with this pandemic is that we we have exponential spread with the virus and so you have to assess the risk to many hundreds and thousands of people beyond yourself and mm -hmm. we're not good at doing that mm -hmm. and you know i think it's incumbent upon these church leaders to consider their parishioners and everybody their parishioners have contact with but, you know, in context, I, I think the government has been careful and has thought, you know, Michelle Luan Grisham has, has really considered the First Amendment implications. You look at these fines levied against businesses, right. you know, over 70 grand last week at O'Reilly Auto Parts. Mm -hmm. You know, they're, they're trying to allow these, these churches to proceed and recognizing the importance in the community and that this provides community for so many people. But, you know, they had to do something. It's a huge affront mm -hmm. uh, to the executive order. Chris, I got a question about messaging. Um, we heard some noise out of the governor's office that, quote, one of the uh, our spokesperson called the pastors, quote, pro-virus. There's something going on here. There's like a loggerheads between the governor's office and some of these larger churches. Something's got to break here, it seems to me. Is that helpful, calling these people pro-virus? It doesn't also help that, and and again, the administration is is what it is. There's there's no opinion on the leader. I actually think the leadership is great. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we started to see it, it, this becomes a discussion of the public information officials on on the state level that have gone through so much burnout that sometimes the way that they've been addressing the public and other reporters in the in, in the past have started, it, it's very obvious of the tension and friction that they're feeling on a day-to-day -day basis. And I specifically point out uh, um, an article that, um, er, or a, a story that was uh, shown on KOB TV and it circulated the social media channels about how disrespectful the answers were from the PIO yes. um, at the time. And, mm -hmm. I, and as, as as controversial as that is to bring up, you know, when you're using terminology like pro-virus or whenever you're creating responses with a lot of rigidity uh, or, or it's it's uh, r rigid in nature, it's it it puts us in a really difficult position to really support um, the the efforts because we we are all trying to find a sense of kindness and hope out of this entire um, situation. And so if if I was the churches or if I was working with another organization that was in a similar situation to avoid conversations like pro-virus, I think it would be, um, it's maybe this sounds naive, but actually responsive, uh, responsive language with kindness and optimism and forward thinking would be better than name calling. Mm -hmm. Giovanna, can I ask you to pick up on this too? It's an interesting bit of this. I I'm interested in your thoughts. Yeah, um, I, uh, you know, I don't know if it's name calling or, or, or if it's just, yeah, it's just poor um, phrasing. But, you know, the, the point is, um, 
that the, the churches were irresponsible. I don't know if that makes them pro-virus. I don't know what pro-virus is. Like, right. everybody wants a virus. Um, right. <laughs> but, uh, but it's definitely irresponsible. And, um, and it's not just, you know, it's not just like a business owner saying, like, come to my store and don't wear a mask. This is a, a leader of, of many people who are following the words that you say, and they are going to do what you do. Um, you know, we've seen this in the political uh, realm, of course, at the national level with the leadership on, on this pandemic. Um, and we're seeing, I, I feel like it's being replicated at this local level in, in the church leadership here. Um, and and the, uh, the explaining away, um, you know, we're serious about the pandemic, the only people that didn't wear a mask are those that we assume had a medical problem. No, no. Right. Those pictures, it was mostly people without masks. They were young. They didn't look like they had a medical problem. I mean, it's just, you know, it, it's not truthful. It's not leadership. Um, and and it's it's irresponsible and it's hurting people. It's hurting people. And and I'm glad Justine brought up this this. Um, uh, conversation of the individual versus the collective, because I think we really need to look at what is the collective benefit here? What is the collective good? How do my individual actions contribute to the collective good? We have to be thinking at a higher level, people. We, we can't just keep on with this, you know, me and my family, we're okay. I'm going to do what I want. Wise it's not words. Like yeah, Never. wise words there. We really appreciate that. Have to leave it there. Unfortunately, our land is next. Then we're back talking about an anti-discrimination ordinance right here in Albuquerque. Public lands in New Mexico hold different meanings for different people, including each of the state's American Indian tribes. On this month's episode of Our Land, we look back to a 2020 conversation between correspondent Laura Pascas and Eugene Herrera, former governor of the Pueblo of Cochiti. Mr. Herrera spoke about the Pueblo's relationship with the landscape and opposition to a bill that Senator Martin Heinrich introduced to make Bandelier National Monument a national park and also open certain lands to public hunting. Now, in 2021, Senator Heinrich plans to reintroduce that bill in the 117th Congress. And while other northern New Mexico Pueblos support the measure, leaders at Cochiti still oppose it and are disappointed the senator plans to try again. To read more, including a statement from the Senator's office, visit the Our Land homepage at nmpbs.org. Councilman Herrera, welcome to the studio today. Good morning. So on one of our recent episodes of Our Land, we focus on public lands, lands that are open to everyone, for everyone to access. But I would imagine that for Pueblo people here in New Mexico, that's a little bit of a different um, idea. These might be ancestral homelands that are now national forests or national monuments that are controlled by federal managers and can be changed through an act of Congress. I was wondering if you could um, help us and help our audience understand what landscapes and, and public lands mean for the Pueblo of Cochiti. Well, Public lands, my first inclination to the way it feels to the Native Americans is that it's alive. It's our mother. It provided for us since time millennium back, and it'll be there providing for us if we allow it to. And um, right now we can see some of the calamities involved, and um, hopefully we can straighten some of them out to give her a better fighting chance to survive and do her job, and in turn let us do our job in stewardship, stewardship and protecting her and encouraging her to a more livelihood. So recently, Senator Martin Heinrich introduced a bill that would change Bandelier National Monument into Bandelier National Park. And many of the Pueblos in the state have said that they support this bill, but the Pueblo of Cochiti does not. Can you talk about what your concerns are with this bill? Well, primary, our primary concern is that it is the traditional and aboriginal home to the Pueblo de Cochiti. And, uh, 
and maybe primarily to the Kerish tribes here, and it is located on our migration routes. It is probably about the last place that we set all as one people before moving to our permanent locations. So it has a lot of significance there. It has been provided with a lot of spiritual and sacred sites to help maintain our cultural way of life. Mm -hmm. And as I understand it, the bill would open up about 4,300 acres um, to hunting that currently are within the monument. Um, what are your worries with that? Well, obviously, it's an influx of people and the crowds. Anytime you get something redesignated from a national monument to a national park, we're looking at maybe a hundredfold increase in crowds. So, you know, there's been numerous fires in the location, so the environment is in a very fragile and uh, infancy stage. It's, it's coming back to life right now, and so it has to be properly taken care of. So, and I apologize if this is too personal, but can you talk about um, your relationship with that landscape um, or the relationship that other people from the Pueblo of Cochiti have with that landscape, either in terms with the wildlife that's there or the, the spaces, the landscape, like why it's so important that it be protected? Yes, a lot of our holy people still go into these areas, we go in there for pilgrimage. There, we have numerous, like I said, s sacred sites in there. We have old villages in there. Uh, the last mesa where we made our last stand against the Vargas is in the immediate location. So it has a lot of very significant, you know, significance to us as uh, Pueblo people in our struggles, in our lives. and. It has so much meaning to us that it helps us maintain our way of life. These days, as you can see, since the first point of contact about five, six hundred years ago, and where the American Indian is now today, and what do you picture it to be in another five hundred years? Is there going to be these sites there available for our children to help maintain their way of life and to keep their way of life? And you have to remember these places are there as a aid in helping us protect ourselves, help, helping us identify ourselves. If we lose that as, for instance, going into the national park, it's going to inhibit us from going in there as freely and as uh, privately as we normally would like to. So that's going to be a big problem for us, but it's also an identification purposes for our younger people, as you can see. Like I said, in the past 500 years, we're on the verge of losing our language right now. And if we lose more, then where are we going to be here in another 500 years? Mm -hmm. And the, that landscape has, like you mentioned, been impacted by fires, including some really big, severe fires. How has that affected the wildlife there and your relationship with the wildlife and, and near reliance on wildlife? Well, as I mentioned earlier, we normally go up there for bows, for ceremonials, and our holy people go there for herbs to help take care of the people and the whole world. And in essence, no, we pray for all people. We pray for our enemies. We pray for you. We pray for people across the world. We help our mother to stay alive, and that's our primary concern, so we're, we're trying our best, and hopefully we can get this message across to other people, is that it's alive, and it's vibrant, it's breathing. Mm -hmm. So the bill, as introduced, would also include a tribal commission. Um, is that a step forward? Um, the federal government is already supposed to consult with tribes on issues like these. So um, your thoughts on the tribal commission that would be a part of this bill? I don't know the vitality of it or how much power it would have because uh, the, final, the final okay for any suggestions that a public commission could suggest um, still can be overwritten by the Secretary of the Interior. So if, the, if they could give it more meat, maybe, I don't know. Mm -hmm. 
So do you feel like, um, and I know you're speaking just for the Pueblo of Cochiti, but do you feel like when there are these sort of big issues that happen, whether it's a, a bill related to a national monument and landscapes or, or other issues that affect tribes, do you feel like you have a voice and a say and a seat at the table? Um, how, how does that work? Um, speaking of seat at the table, I think that's what may have brought some of the problems about here for Cochiti is, um, there was really no major prior consultation or, or anybody coming to the village saying, hey, we're going to propose this. Senator Martin Heinrich came to the Pueblo de Cochiti in 2017 when I was serving my first term as governor. And he made no mention of it to us. And the leadership in 2018 was given the burden of having to address it at that time. We sent in some protest letters at that time. And then I became uh, governor again in 2019. I was appointed, so we started pursuing it again. And, mm -hmm. and here we are again now, still talking about it. Right. And Cochiti tribal officials recently went to Washington, D.C. Um, to, to talk with uh, folks about the bill, um, what would you like to see happen? Um, are there changes to the bill or do you just hope that it doesn't pass? What would you like to see? I would like to see it not pass. I would like to see it derailed if it could. I think um, it needs to be readdressed, maybe through the all public council of governors and do it the proper way. You know, they need to listen to our voice. Um, I know uh, they're claiming that there's a majority of the Pueblos who are in favor of it, but there are some that are not, and it's primarily the 10 Southern Governors Council that we've opposed it. We've sent in letters of support to Cochiti Pueblo, so we stand there now, and that's where we're at. Mm -hmm. Are there any positives to the bill or anything that it, how it could be changed that might make uh, the Pueblo of Cochiti more comfortable with the bill? I don't think there's any room for compromise because it's, uh, like I said, there's reverence from the Pueblo and other tribes for that area. We have so many close spiritual connections to it. Like I said, it's probably our last gathering home. Right. And are you, is the pub, I was looking at a map and the, the Pueblo of Cochiti is um, cl closest to this area, is that right, than some of the other Pueblos? Right. Okay. It's a stone throw maybe about a mile to the southern boundary. It, it borders up against our reservation to the newly purchased Cañada de Cochiti, which we purchased. So we have... Um, we have that going on. We are trespassing and other issues. We have two monuments adjacent to the reservation. We have Kashakatui on the west, and we see the problems with crowding there, and we can imagine what we can see if Bandelier were to turn into a national park. Right. Um, and my last question for you is, what do you wish that people in New Mexico better understood about the relationship that the Pueblo of Cochiti has with these landscapes? that it's there to provide a healthy way of life for everybody on this world, and that we go there to help pray for all people. And we don't want that broken. If that's broken, then we'll, what's gonna happen? We're gonna have to fend for ourselves. And it's gonna be chaotic at that time. But Right now, we have the sources there that we'd like to keep intact since the millennium. It's been there, it was given to us by the Creator to help us maintain it and keep the world in harmony with peace. And we'd like to see it pursued along them lines. Mm. Councilman Herrera, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to give Cochiti Pueblo's perspective. Thank you. Albuquerque has become the latest city to pass the, quote, Crown Act, which stands for creating a respectful and open world for natural hair. That's the crown bit. Now, the ordinance which cities, a lot of states, and the U.S. House have passed 
prohibits discrimination based on ethnic hairstyles or head coverings like burkas. And Giovanna, Councilor Lancena pushed this measure. It's been out there in the community, particularly for black women here in uh, New Mexico for a long time. Why is it important? Uh, well, it, it is really important. There have been stories both locally and nationally about different um, kids, children and, and adults being discriminated against in school, at work, um, for the way their hair looks. And little girls in classrooms being told that their hair is um, uh, distracting your hair is distracting uh so for for all of those reasons and and it's it's uh basically um discrimination uh to 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 say those things to kids or adults um in in any situation so i think it's important because it it really sheds light on on this issue that um that has been happening that i think a, a lot of people who may not have um, have experienced this, that they're not aware that it's actually happening to other people. So mm -hmm. I think first and foremost, it's raising the raising the issue. Um, it's educating, which is what a lot of times these bills do. You know, they really serve as a as an education tool to mm -hmm. start the conversation. We wouldn't be talking about this right here on this show without this. Um, so yeah, I think it's important. Mm -hmm. Crystal, interestingly, you know, a lot of us are familiar with the subtle forms of discrimination and it's easy to explain skin color, you know, sexual orientation, stuff like that. But when it comes to hair, a lot of folks just don't see it. Like, how can you possibly be discriminated against because of your hair? It's hard well, to, to get that across to folks, isn't it? It is. But one of the things that the legislation I just caught within like the last 30 seconds is mm -hmm. that it also said cultural headdress. That's right. And when you said that Councilor Senate had sponsored it, the light bulb, um, you know, I've always said, I don't know what's going to come out of my mouth whenever the, the show starts to air, but it instantly the light bulb came off and, mm -hmm. and called me on and said, oh, wait, Councilor Senate's platform is always advocating for communities of, of color, including the Asian community mm -hmm. being Vietnamese and Asian um, city councilor. So then, so it made me realize, oh, the cultural headdress argument is because of Southeast Asian women. Southeast Asian women and the hijab, uh, the hijab had, and how um, it's either a job or the headdress that they have to lose in order to um, to participate in, in in a community or an economy. So uh, not only is she advocating for communities of, of color that are black, obviously because of um, issues with uh, people cut, having, are forced to cut their, um, their uh, um, cornrows or, or their dreads or whatever mm -hmm. it might be, but it's also protecting and, and inviting communities that have to wear cultural head dresses as a part of their culture and religion. It's, it's inviting them to making sure that um, Albuquerque is a more accepting city and that discrimination, and it shows outwardly, or I would imagine for a council Senate, it shows outwardly that um, our community is not going to be discriminating against a culture, no matter what is on your head or not. Mm -hmm. Justine, the black, um... A lot of black women were involved with this. The black, the BCOC is a big group around here, the Black Central Organizing Committee. A huge number of women were after this, but there's going to be activity in our state legislature coming up on this. What's your, what's your sense when it comes to statewide versus citywide ordinances like this? Well, and nationwide. I mean, and mm -hmm. one entity you didn't name, which makes me wonder and makes me somewhat suspicious is Dove's involvement in this um, campaign. Anytime you have a corporation who sells products and stands to gain um, from the passage of legislation, you know, you kind of wonder where this all came from. I mean, Dove is selling hair products um, to to the population, the interest groups um, who, who want to see this pass. Let me first say, though, that I think there's no dispute that we have really important protections um, to preserve along race and religious lines. And so I, I, my understanding is that um, this is an effort, although you know title, we have laws like Title VII, other civil rights laws that, and, and in New Mexico, the Human Rights Act and in the city, our human rights ordinance, that are supposed to protect people from racial discrimination, that this is like a big hole where, you know, we're just, people are unsatisfied, dissatisfied because courts are not finding that discrimination 
based upon somebody's hair, where where people feel this is so in, so closely tied to race and should be recognized as racial discrimination, it isn't happening. My question is, will it work? I mean, there are lots of societal ills that you can't you can't heal or fix with a bill. So when I read this ordinance and when I and when I look at the proposed state law, and I won't take too long, I I can tell. Um, you create all kinds of problems. I mean, if somebody wants to work on a movie set and they have the wrong kind of hair for the part, they're going to be an extra in New Mexico and they don't get chosen. Does that give rise to a lawsuit? Mm -hmm. um, if a firefighter wants to have dreadlocks and they can't wear the appropriate mask and equipment, does that give rise to a lawsuit? I see no exceptions in either um, mm -hmm. bill or here the ordinance that's been passed for those kinds of issues. And that's a problem for employers. We may want to educate people and bring light to an issue but this is a huge burden and it's going to be job killing um, if it's if it's not if things aren't drafted narrowly enough. Mm -hmm. um, and so I worry a little bit about the statewide legislation going too far. It's, I don't Just, know Justine, is this one of those deals where you put the law on the ground and just sort of see what happens and shape it as it goes down the road? I mean, this yeah, seems I think like that's a... very dangerous. Yeah. I mean, that, that's why we like things to proceed incrementally in the courts. That's why the case law develops slowly, yeah. because you can have all kinds of unintended consequences. But I do think that's the intent of the drafters. They want to see what happens. Gotcha. Got to well, wrap there, guys, that... unfortunately. Thank you to all the panelists for reading up and weighing in this week. I'm sorry, we're just a little short on time. Appreciate it. I suppose one could view what happened at the U.S. Capitol earlier this week as inevitable. The logical and tragic endpoint of a fuse lit long ago. It's embarrassing, infuriating, and ultimately it left a feeling as if we hit bottom of some sort. But maybe that's the better end of this sordid event. Every situation has to have a low point in their story arc before things start to improve. And we have two weeks before we have our traditional change of power in the presidency. Two weeks to sell any last grievances regarding the vote tally and anything else holding us back from moving forward as a nation. Now, lost in the noise is we had our own protests at the Roundhouse at the same time the incursion at the Capitol building was happening. They found a way to make their point and stay outside of the building. It's not that hard. Thanks again for joining us. We're staying informed and engaged. We will see you again next week in Focus. Funding for New Mexico in Focus provided by the McCune Charitable Foundation and the Dnieper Natural History Programming Fund for KNME-TV and viewers like you.